Okay. Uh, if we could turn the lights down as far as possible, allowing me enough light. Oh, and I can still read, which is good. Um, Thank you, for, Tony, for the introduction and for inviting me here. It is a great pleasure to be in Berkeley. It is always a pleasure to be in Berkeley. I can't believe you people are lucky enough to live here. <laughs> um, I'd like to begin, actually, with a, a short prologue um, about Goya's titles. Now, The four series of etchings created by Francisco Goya are familiar to many, represented on the screen here. Los Caprichos, published in 1799. Los Desastres de la Guerra, published posthumously in 1863, though, as we'll see tonight, etched from 1810 to 1814. Uh, la Torre Machia, published during his life, 1816. And Los Disparates, also published posthumously in 1864. Now, the first three are numbered series with titles for each image. Los Caprichos y the Desastres have engraved captions. And Goya added an introductory page to La Torre Machia, identifying the subject of each of its 33 plates. The last series, however, Los Disparates, was published without captions. And perhaps because of this is the least studied and exhibited of all of Goya's print series. We seem to embrace the verbal clues, often using them as a point of departure for interpretation of the images. Oops, I'm not there yet. Okay. Um, Goya's images, and particularly the disasters of war, also lend themselves to our own verbal concepts. The image now on screen, for example, might be familiar to many as the cover illustration of Susan Sontag's regarding the pain of others. But I think our dependence on the written word might limit how we look at Goya. We should remember that most of the titles of Goya's paintings are posthumous. And in the case of etchings, as well as most of Goya's drawings, Goya assigned a caption long after the image was first conceived. So today, I plan to avoid as much as possible titles and captions in considering images inspired by the Napoleonic War that ravaged Spain from 1808 to 1814. In looking at images that would be published posthumously as the disasters of war, I turn to untitled working proofs, such as that now on the screen. These record stages in the development of both the individual plate as well as the series to which it belongs. More on that later. A man in a shirt, his pants fallen to his knees, possibly to su suggest castration, hangs lifeless from a tree. Similar figures behind show that this is not a unique occurrence. Yet only the foreground figure inspires the contemplation of a man seated to the right, head rested on his hand, and with an expression and gaze suggesting contemplation. Our knowledge of the historical context of the etching leads us to identify the victim as a Spaniard and the onlooker as a French soldier. Beyond the image itself, the aquitant ground around it has been burnished to create clean margins. Here. In which you see two numbers. In the lower left, 39. In the upper left, 36. Now, this is one of four recorded proofs of this plate with both of these numbers. And I'll get more, I'll return to their me meaning later in the lecture. But it shows how Goya was thinking and rethinking how to order the image within the series even before he added a title. Goya thought in images. Titles were an afterthought. He also often thought in groups of images that explore multiple dimensions of a single theme. From his earliest work at the Madrid court, groups of cartoons for tapestries to de decorate specific rooms in the royal residences of the Pardo in the Escorial, to his drawings, to his late black paintings, we learn that for Goya, a single image rarely sufficed. Thus, this afternoon, I would like to examine a trio and a pair of paintings, as well as selected etchings from the disasters of war. To illustrate a development of Goya's narrative imagery from 1809 to 1814. And I would like to suggest how this evolving imagery of atrocity informed his monumental paintings of the 2nd and 3rd of May, created in 1814.
Turning to the main subject at hand, we begin by looking back two centuries to 1811. Spain was in the midst of a six-year war against Napoleon, whose brother Joseph, Part, uh, Joseph Bonaparte sat on the Spanish throne. On March 11th of that year, and I figured that's 200 years ago next Friday, Francisco Goye Lucientes swore allegiance to the intruder king. This is the only document of the, his activity that we have for the entire year of 1811. Meanwhile, far from Madrid on the island of Mallorca, family mourned the death of one of Span the Spanish army's leading military commanders. His most excellent, Senor Don Pedro Caro y Sureda Maza de Lizana, or the Marques de la Romana, who had suffered a fatal heart attack on the 23rd of January. Now, the stories of Goya and the Marques intersect in an inventory of the, prop of the Marques' property drawn up in June 1811 in Palma by a painter, Guillermo Ferrer. Among the items listed are 11 small paintings with gilt frames that are caprichos of Goya. Now, we tend, of course, to associate the term capricho with the well-known series of etchings that Goya had published in 1799. However, the, first, uh, the artist had first used that term, so far as I've been able to find, five years earlier in a letter of January 1794, accompanying 11 paintings sent to his colleagues at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of St. Ferdinand in Madrid. In it, he describes the works as a new departure from commissioned works in which caprice and invention have no limits. Three days later, Goya sent another work to complete the series, describing it as a corral de locos, or yard with lunatics, here on the right. Two more days passed before he requested that the works be released to the Marques de Villaverde so that his daughter, talented in drawing, could see them. This final request suggests that although Goya painted these capriccio, uh, although these painted caprichos were not commissioned, Goya was eager to find buyers. And the inclusion of paintings by the artist, identified as caprichos or borrones, sketches, in contemporary inventories of private collections attests to his success. Now this is one of the eight small paintings that belonged to the Marques and remains in the family. Three, uh, there were 11 mentioned in the uh, inventory. We only know of eight of them today. Although this group of eight paintings was formally assigned a single date in the early 1990s by Juliet Wilson, it's now pretty much accepted that it encompasses paintings of at least three different styles and different dates. Um, one is a scene of friar in a prison scene, probably the earliest, and then there is a scene of bandits, uh, and then the scenes that we'll be discussing tonight. Now, the, the trio of painted caprichos owned by the Marques that will concern us here are linked by a warm-toned underpainting and also by their dimensions. They measure about 13 by 23 inches. The number of paintings within the Marquesa's collection clearly suggests that he was a known patron who acquired Goya's works over time. And indeed, he seems like a likely patron for Goya's works, um, given his wealth, and also his learning that is reflected in the catalog of his extensive library, covering su subjects from theology and jurisprudence to philosophy, politics, fine arts, and even censored books, obras reservadas, including works by Thomas Paine, Rousseau, Voltaire, and Mirabeau. The three painted caprichos illustrated here might even have been conceived specifically for the Marques, a hero of Spain's resistance to the French. Stylistic details clearly relate the scenes to the Marquesas collect, uh, in the Marquesas collection to earlier painted caprichos. The delicately painted piled bodies emerging on the dark, uh, from darkness on the left in a detail from the attack on the military encampment, as well as sort of the inc uh, incandescent smoke-filled atmosphere of the scene of the attack, recall an earlier undocumented capriccio showing a catastrophe usually identified as a fire at night, probably painted some 10 to 15 years earlier. 
Also, we'll see when we return to the Romana Caprichos, accents of primary colors, blue, gold, and red, repeat a trait that uh, we've seen in earlier painted Caprichos. And here, for example, he, he includes an accent of blue on the wheel, red, yellow, red, blue, just to in, sort of enliven a rather otherwise earth, earthy toned composition. And finally, the woman in the scene of attack, running with child, uh, wears, seems to have borrowed her costume from the woman in sh the shipwreck with a white bodice and yellow skirt. And again, this is probably something Goya did for a color accent, since um, you know, most women tend to dress in black in the Madrid of his time. Thus, the painted caprichos that concern us here were part of a well-established genre within Goya's works by 1808. Inspired, I will suggest, by the earliest years of the war and possibly even intended for Goya's military and painted for Goya's military patron. This afternoon, I will also suggest that there were our Goya's final painted caprichos. I hope to show that his subsequent experience of imagining atrocity in etching engendered a new verisimilitude in portraying imagined events, defined by new attention to gesture, expression, detail, and time that transforms capriccio into narrative. In keeping with the imagined imaginative theme implied by the word capriccio, this scene defies the lo narrative logic implied by its modern title, Attack on a Military Encampment. The assailants on the right seem to be stationary, more a firing squad than active attackers. Their vague and varied costumes make it impossible to identify them with any specific troops. The victims on the left, many in military uniform, lie dying. And although they are ostensibly under attack, two figures get in the line of fire to remove the dead bodies, something that would normally wait until after the attack. Once the woman has emerged, what she, uh, and why she runs in front of the squad rather than away from it, her difference in scale from the other figures remain unexplained. Confusion of time, scale, and actions suggest that this was not conceived as a narrative, but rather as a pastiche of disjointed, warlike vignettes. A similar disregard for narrative, I think, is seen in the work known today as the Plague Hospital. Again, the title is posthumous, allowing us to ask what exactly is Goya depicting. It may be a hospital, a military holding camp for civilians, a shelter for refugees. And Goya chooses to leave the meaning open as he assembles figures of suffering and charity in an elliptical composition that emerges from the gray shadows of the upper left, plays heightened by accents of primary colors across the foreground, and dissolves again into the gray shadows. Some figures converse, others are isolated in their misery. A woman covers her mouth and nose as she offers a prostate figure some drink. At center, a silhouetted figure seems to raise herself to communicate with this figure sprawled open before her and facing her. And on the far corner, we see again the woman in the yellow skirt, seemingly lifeless, her hand over her, her arm extended over her child. But what misfortunes have brought the figures here, whether war, famine, plague, or some other tragedy remains unclear. It's the context of the series and the date I propose of 1809 that is the best evidence for relating it with the war. But then we're faced with another image, known that has been variously identified as gypsies in a cave or vagabonds in a cave. It appears at first to be unrelated to the themes of war, uh, possible themes of war and suffering that we see in the other paintings. Delicately defined, recumbent, and intertwined figures with precisely brushed highlights that lift their forms out of darkness again recall the piled bodies that we've seen before. But in contrast to earlier paintings of catastrophe, this scene seems to have a playful quality as scattered accents of colors brighten the composition where smirking women watch over exhausted men. 
who are sprawled on the floor of a cave that they share with sketchily defined donkeys. Now, the context provided by the images of assault and institutionalization moves me to look beyond the apparent humor and suggest that perhaps this sub painting subject might be related to the war and its depiction of a type of fighter born of Spain's struggle against Napoleon, the guerrilla. We recall that the word guerrilla, it derives from the Spanish guerra, and may refer either to a small skirmish carried out by independent fighters or to the fighters involved in such a skirmish originating as small bands of fighters that would undermine the enemy in the Spanish countryside, the nature of the guerrillas would shift during the five-year course of the war, and this has been studied very well by Charles Easdale. They became eventually identified with larger groups under well-known leaders, and eventually came to complicate the life of the regular Spanish army, and ultimately fell into disre uh, disrepute. Now, Goya here, I'd like to suggest, with a date dating these paintings before the disasters of war into about 1809, um, represents the guerrilla as perceived in the early years of conflict as small bands of peasants whose own lives had been so affected by the French that they sought their own revenge. Now, at this point, nothing in the dress distinguished guerrillas from the peasants. With a precise knowledge of the land, they also found they could find refuge in mountains and caves. According to the account of one French cavalryman stationed in the Andalusian town of Ronda, laborers from that town would pretend to leave work for the fields only to retrieve their guns from nearby farmhouses and pass their time sitting on rocks and olive groves firing on the French. Now, it was also difficult to distinguish guerrillas from outlaws. In Easdale's words, and I quote, Bandits who preyed on the French and their supporters might legitimately assume the status of freedom fighters, and just as patriotic guerrillas leaders might find themselves at the head of men who aspired only to pillage and highway robbery. Finally, Goya's smiling young women hint at the lack of discipline among guerrillas noted by the British diplomat Thomas Sydenham in a letter to the Duke of Wellington in 1812. Now, he observes that the guerrillas, quote, prevented the recruiting of regular armies, for every Spanish peasant would naturally prefer rioting and plunder and living in free quarters with the guerrillas to being drilled and starved in the regular army. On the whole, therefore, it may be said that the guerrillas did as much mischief to the country as, as they did to the French, end quote. Now, the fanciful approach, which I'm suggesting for the Romana Caprichos, suggests to me that they preceded Goya's development of aquitan etchings that would eventually become known as the disasters of war, central to any discussion of the artist's imagery of war. Now, the date of 1810, etched into three stylistically early plates, two of which I show here, suggests to most scholars that Goya began the series in this year. Uh, only three plates bear a date, and then he left off dating, and eventually he left off signing the plates. And you can see, well, if you're sitting up close, the date of Goya, 1810, and down here, Goya, 1810. His exploration of the theme of uh, over the next three, possibly four years, led him away from the compositional format seen in painted caprichos to narrative invented to suggest crucial moments and told through costume, gesture, and expression. The resulting realism has given these etchings staying power as universal icons of human violence, suffering, and injustice. As political image, images, they continue to appear as illustrations of the vicissitudes of war and torture in editorial costumes, uh, columns. As works of art, they've inspired works as diverse as Pablo Picasso's etching of the dream and lie of Franco on the left, or Jake and Dinos Chapman's controversial rectification of the series, in which all of the victims were given the heads of puppies and clowns. Published posthumously in 1863, the images of the first edition are very different from the proofs printed by the artists, or at least under his supervision. But we tend to think, uh, Thomas Harris, who cataloged them, tend to think the uneven printing suggests that Goya may have pulled the proofs himself. And this is seen in this comparison of a working proof with a pencil caption on the left, with a first edition pull on the right. 
Uh, the impression on the right, as you can see, of the first edition has an overall tone of aquatint that really deadens the contrast intended by the artist. In the proof on the left, there is a rhythm of white, black, white that leads us through the string of corpses into the right background. And this is lost in the first edition. Again, uh, my illustrations are proofs pulled during Goya's lifetime, very possibly by the artist himself, prior to the addition of engraved captions. I should say also, sometimes I'll refer to numbers, but not all my images, I can't get images of the exact proof with the number, but the image, if it does not have a number, has a proof similar that is known to have numbers. Okay, now, most of the studies of the disasters of war have focused on the series as published by the Royal Academy of San Fernando in 1863, or its predecessor, a leather-bound volume of 85 proofs today in the British Museum with a manuscript title page that, translating into English, reads, Fatal Consequences of the Bloody War in Spain with Bonaparte and other allegorical caprichos, caprichos enfaticos, in 85 plates, invented, drawn, and etched by the original painter Don Francisco de Goya y Lucientes in Madrid. A note at the foot of the page states, attributed to the 19th century collector Valentin Carrera, who owned the album, states that this unique set was ordered and bound so that the collector Don Agustin Teán Bermúdez could correct the captions, as well as this frontispiece, and so must be held in great esteem. The captions are in Goya's hand, end quote. Now, these observations are repeated on the verso, where there's also a penciled note that the volume had been lent to the Academy of San, San Fernando, where we know it served as the model for the ordering of the series published by the, the, the Academy in 1863, almost 35 years after the artist's death. However, if we tonight want to consider the disasters of war within the context of Goya's evolving imagery from 1809 to 1814, a key question should be asked. What did the series look like by 1814? As Spain, liberated from the French occupation, awaited the return of the Bourbon monarch, Ferdinand VII. As mentioned earlier, Goya left us an important clue by adding numbers in dry point or burn to the lower left corners of 58 of the plates. The proof on the left of the well-known, which would eventually become, uh, is often identified with um, Agustina of Saragossa, um, has the number 41 etched in the lower left corner, although it would be replaced by the number seven, or, uh, would be placed as number seven in the Seán Bermúdez album, where this number seven is not yet on this image, sorry. The proof on the right, seen at the beginning of the lecture, bears both numbers, okay, 39 on the lower left and 36, it's placed in the final edition, in the upper left. Scholars agree that the numbers were in all likelihood assigned by the artist himself, making them the only series of his etchings numbered on the plate by Goya. Now, what the numbers in the lower left reveal is a smaller series, more coherently focused on war and famine, prior to the addition of the more enigmatic satires, the caprichos enfaticos, or allegorical caprichos, thought to refer to the repression that followed the restoration of Ferdinand VII in May 1814, here illustrated on the right. Now, none of the allegorical caprichos have numbers in the lower left, supporting the thesis that they were added to the earlier series of war images following the restoration of Ferdinand. Thus, the caprichos enfaticos remain outside the development of Goya's imagery of war to 1814, and so will uh, not be discussed here today. Now, we can only speculate as to why Goya never published the disasters of war. Now, certainly during the war, the printing of an edition would have been difficult, if not impossible. Materials were in short supply, and the other thing is, who would there have been to buy these images? And after the war, Goya may well have realized that there would have been few interested in such gruesome subjects. Moreover, these scenes of suffering, the suffering populace could hardly have appealed to the restored King Ferdinand, returning from comfortable wartime exile at Talleyrand's estate in France. And perhaps they 
would even have been seen as subversive. The expansion of the series with the addition of the allegorical caprichos after 1814 suggests a change in purpose from a testimony of war to a critique of war and restoration. Now, whether the artist ever thought the compilation he gave to San Bernudes would see the publication and would see publication remains an open question. Now, the earlier number version opens with two images of execution. Oops, sorry, two images of execution. The first shows a man executed by garroting. A knife hangs from a cord around his neck. Written on a placard his, uh, around his chest begins por because of. The second image repeats this theme, showing several men seated and bound, some with instruments of their crime, sabers or knives, around their necks. Both reflect laws issued by the French occupation forces to execute any Spaniard found with arms. Those sentenced were to wear around their necks the weapon with which they were found, as well as a placard explaining their crime. Considered a more humane mode of execution than the firing squad or hanging, garroting was adopted by Joseph Bonaparte in October 1809. More than 40 executions were reported in the Diario de Madrid from 1810 to 1812. So in the series ultimately published, 1863, these plates would be moved to plates 34 and 35. But here, as opening plates for the series as first planned, these executions set a documentary tone with a very specific resonance for Madrid audience for which I think Goya might have originally intended the series. The two images immediately following as plates three and four introduced themes of famine and battle continued throughout. Now, it's not my intent to, rep uh, to present a full reconstruction. However, I have done this and realized that in, even in the earlier numbered series, any attempt to trace a clear narrative line or logic in sequence fails. And perhaps this is Goya's greatest contribution to the imagery of war, as he conveys the inadequacy of the artist or narrator to comprehend chaos. From his Madrid studio, Goya suggests war's shifting series of events by a seemingly random sequence of relentless devastation that takes as its victims soldiers and civilians in country and town by battle, famine, bombardment, or execution. Now, also in thinking about the disasters as part of an artistic evolution, we have to consider their order even before he assigned those first numbers. That is to try and think about how Goya, how, in the order in which they were created. Now, specific cl clues, Goya's tendency to sign early plates and the, few de de the three dated 1810 are a few. Attempts to reconstruct this chronology rely on a consideration of stylistic traits, and then it is loose, but I'm going to make an attempt tonight. Now, like the earlier painted caprichos showing victims of natural disasters or military attacks, I suggest that the earliest images have a delicacy that belies their gruesome subjects, as illustrated by the earliest known working proof of an image that would subsequently bear the sardonic title Caridad, or Charity. And I show the working proof from the Museum of Fine Arts on the left, and on the right with penciled caption, the same image from the San Bermudez album. Now, in the earlier proof on the left, finely etched lines and small dots suggest the subtly shaded volumes of these anonymous, idealized bodies. But context subverts the idealism of the figures. Here, their clothes have been stripped by those who might still use them before they are thrown without ceremony into a mass grave. With the complexity and weight of intertwined figures offset by an abstract background, divided diagonally into areas with light and shade, the composition perhaps recalls the Romana freedom fighters in a cave. In the etching, however, a man is introduced standing with crossed arms, sometimes identified as a self-portrait of the artist. He serves as witness to the carnage, and indeed, Goya begins to make, draw variations on piles of corpses by the introduction of witnesses that strip, mourn, or sometimes turn ill 
at the sight of the dead. Now another composition that I would put earlier in the series is this one that really illustrates the unprecedented modernity of Goya's imagery of war. Rather than a battle scene, we observe the wounded within a makeshift military hospital. A triangular configuration orders the composition, its angles marked by a man recuperated, adjusting his dressing or perhaps his boot, the buttocks of a man who is being held by these two figures and being operated on by this surgeon, and then a corpse here covered over but sort of indecorously uh, sprawling. In the foreground, an inert sack of linen anchors the scene. Now this equivalence of living, lifeless, inert forms implies, I think, a scene witnessed, unedited by art. In contrast to the confused or still time of the earlier painted caprichos, Goya scene enhances the scene by introducing a sense of the moment. The man adjusting his dressing will soon stand. The intense focus of the medic, which I'm afraid you'll have to see in another time, cannot be sustained, and nor can the figure be supported for long by the two assistants. Continuing to imagine atrocities of war, Goya moves beyond compositions of intricately defined interdependent figures to capture confrontation between antagonists, individualized by gesture and expression. On the left, a young woman plants herself solidly to fight the embrace of the leering assailant who grabs the fabric of her dress, unaware of the older man approach, of the older woman behind approaching with raised dagger. On the right, a woman, wide-eyed in terror, confronts her assailant as behind a man lies, incapacitated, about to be castrated. Another woman on the, on, on the left of that scene grimaces in the embrace of her adversary. Within the evolution of Goya's imagery, this new concern with the momentary forces the artist to a new precision in imagining what he did not see. Now, this, the sense of time might also be elaborated as part of a sequence. On the left, a foreground figure is about to be executed before a firing squad unseen. Before him, a bleeding corpse implies the inevitable outcome and also the time passed. Antithetic to the confusion of the Romana painting of the attack, this diagrammatic representation of past and present anticipates Goya expa Goya's expansion of, na of narrative linking the 2nd and 3rd of May. Now, in some of the most powerful and most often reproduced images of atrocity, Goya appeals to a sense of time to express pain that cannot last because it cannot be endured inflicted as men are tortured and castrated. As humane viewers, we can only hope, but cannot know that the atrocities are of short duration. And when Goya does suspend time, he does so with full knowledge of its power. The blinded fury of struggle gives way to life stilled. We join the French soldier in contemplating a single victim in a line of hanged men. I think this image complicates partisan readings. The expression of a soldier is pensive and almost sad. Did he have a choice? Or is he, like the hangman, also a victim? Ultimately, subsidiary actions and living witnesses disappear. As icon beyond narrative and time, the scene on the right leaves the viewer to contemplate the naked and dismembered forms bound or hanging from a tree. Almost at the center of the image, we confront the gaping wound of the castrated corpse. Etching is a technique of great precision. Forms cannot easily be blurred or details obfuscated as they might be in a painting. Yet the specificity of detail that emerges in the disasters of war, I believe, influenced Goya's subsequent conceptualization of painted imagery. The two paintings now on the screen illustrate a new attention to detail, defining a departure from the more generic scenes of earlier painted caprichos, transforming capriccio into narrative. First recorded in an 1834 inventory of the royal collection taken at the death of Ferdinand VII, these paintings on wood panel were probably acquired from, possibly gifted by, the artist. 
Old inscriptions pasted on the back of the panels identify their subjects as the production of gunpowder and shot organized by Jose Mayen in the Sierra de Tardiente, near Cuesca, between 1811 and 1813. Although we can't know, I've been unable to find any more information about this, and we can't know whether this was indeed Goya's intended subject. But imagine with a new attention to detail, a recipe for shot is offered in the panel on the left. Actually, the process begins on the right, on, on the right of the, of the panel here, where the lead is melted and poured into molds. Once molded, the balls are cut on the left and then rolled in canister by the figures at the center, overseen once again by that, wit uh, that's, uh, that witness figure who here becomes a supervisor. Now in the making of gunpowder, the picture on the right, men grind from left to right the mixture of saltpeter, sulfur, and carbon. A central figure in a white shirt packages the powder in wooden containers. Behind him, a figure in black who apparently oversees the work directs those who carry off the boxes of gunpowder to the right. Now, from his earlier years as a designer of tapestries, Goya had been sensitive to the pairing of images. The right-to-left narrative in the making of shot might be explained if we imagine this work hanging on the left with the fabrication of gunpowder to the right, as seen here. Beginning with the cutting of the molded shot, we follow a shallow serpentine line that takes us forward to the central figures, back to the fire, which leads to the second scene by the picking, up, picking up the gold and red of the costumes worn by the figures grinding the powder, forward again to the man packing the powder, and then back into the distance where the figures carry off the boxes. I think it's a masterful pairing of two works, anticipating that again with the 2nd and 3rd of May. Now, of course, the history of those paintings, today known as the 2nd and 3rd of May, posthumous title, has long been traced to a document of, the, of March 1814 from the Secretary of Internal Affairs of the Interim Government that preceded the return of Ferdinand in, 18, in, in May of that year. In it, the Secretary acknowledges Goya's proposal, lost to us, but a proposal of the 24th of February to, quote, perpetuate by his brush the most notable and heroic actions of, or scenes of our glorious insurrection against the tyrant of Europe, end quote. And acknowledging that, he also offers to pay the artist for his materials, as well as a monthly stipend of 1,500 reales for his work. In the absence of any further documentation prior to their mention in 1834 inventory of the Museo del Prado, art historians, myself included, have speculated on their early history. One theory supposed that they were intended to celebrate the return of Ferdinand VII to Madrid in, early, in May. However, this would have given Goya less than two months from the date of March to paint um, both of these very complex works. That hardly re that's hardly realistic when we recall you know, a painting of an equestrian portrait of Ferdinand uh, in 1808, a, a much simpler composition for sure, uh, took, the war, uh, took the artist uh, a full month. And even then it needed uh, several months, weeks to dry before it could be installed. What is more, the conservative repression that accompanied Ferdinand's return to Madrid in May led to the detainment that night of Alvarez Guerra, who had signed the agreement for Goya's works two months earlier. Given these shifting events, Goya may well have waited to proceed until the situation had clarified. New evidence brought up, uh, introduced in the catalog, uh, exhibition catalog at the Prado after, uh, in 2008, which also uh, celebrated the, the cleaning and, and restoration of these paintings, um, uh, was proposed. It proposes, um, it consists of invoices for the construction, hardware, and gilding of Marcos de Cuadros Grandes de Pinturas Alusivas al Día de, uh, dos de Mayo de 1808, or frames for two large paintings alluding to the 2nd of May 1808 for the Royal Palace. Although the artist of the paintings is not named, the measurement of the frames suggested by one of the two documents corresponds to Goya's works, 
although some scholars have noted the discrepancy of the measurements between the invoices presented by the carpenter and that presented by the gilder to discredit this evidence. Now, the absence of any contemporary documents concerning or in response to Goya's paintings also supports their having belonged to the royal collection. This would also explain how they came to the Royal Museum of the Prado by 1834. Now, the 3rd of May, what well, the painting today known as the 3rd of May on the right, reproduced in art history surveys, emulated from master, by masters from Monet to Picasso, is usually analyzed, analyzed in isolation from Goya's imagery of the Napoleonic War and even from its pendant, today known as the 2nd of May, the painting on the left. In its representation of the execution of Spanish patriots, their expressions illuminated by a single lantern, their path of escape blocked by a barren hill, it offers a compelling antithesis to the paintings of Napoleonic triumphs produced north of the Pyrenees. This thematic antithesis carries over into Goya's style as Goya overturns the finish of his French contemporaries. He applies his paint broadly, creating ex extreme contrasts of the whitest white of the victim's shirt and the blackest night of the sky, creating a stark drama that corroborates the raw emotion of the victims. Both of these paintings bring to the monumental scale of history painting the precision of detail, time, and cruelty of the, of the disasters of war. Their subject is the uprising against French forces of the populace in Madrid. Sp uh, to the Spaniards, who once, re once they realized that the last member of, members of the royal family were actually being evacuated you know, from the palace. Now, Records of the 413 Spaniards killed and the 167 wounded in the uprising show that the mob encompassed men and women from a variety of social classes and professions, ranging from uh, personnel from the royal household to prisoners from the city jail. It is this mob that floods into the canvas from the left, assaulting the mounted Mamluk mercenaries and the officers of Napoleon's army. Although traditionally identified as the taking place in Madrid's Puerta del Sol, the setting is in fact fairly generic, like those of the disasters, a suggestion of the city. Figures lie fallen, others are in mid-attack. We recall that the early etchings of the disasters of war focused on inert bodies piled together towards the center of the page. We might remember that as Goya continued to work on the series, his compositions changed as seen in uh, the composition on the right. He imagines a view from a worm's eye view from below, and he focuses on fewer, more monumental figures, often in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The, combat. the combatants are clearly defined by their dress as the French soldiers fall before the Spanish patriot, identified by his working class clothes, his muscularity, his emotion. That same immediacy and attention to realistic detail is monumentalized in Goya's painted canvas. As is often noted, these paintings mark a departure in the representation of, event, of an event of recent history. Goya abandons the bird's eye view of, assumed by his French contemporaries, represented on the right, and figures that were once the supporting cast now become the main protagonists. As in many etchings of the disasters, the action extends beyond the limits of the canvas. Although there is a mob, each face, expression, and gesture is individualized. The human element dominates. But the ultimate innovation of the painting, again attributed to the influence of the disasters, is the graphic nature of the violence portrayed, the blood, the stabbing, the hand-to-hand -hand combat. The central scene of the patriot in brown attacking the Mameluke falling from his horse is, to my knowledge, unique in the history of art. Goya leaves no doubt. The falling Mameluke is already dead, yet the patriot continues his assault. The focus of his gaze and of the gaze of the mounted Mameluke behind, who watches horrified, reveals that beyond stabbing, the patriot is crazed, aims to mutilate, to castrate his fallen adversary. Such emasculation depicted or implied frequently in Goya throughout the disasters, or by Goya throughout the disasters, marks the ultimate revenge. I had 
I had always had trouble understanding the second of May. In teaching and writing, I presented it as a melee, a Baroque play of color and form that stood in contrast to the unrelenting geometry and explicit cruelty of the third of May. With mounted Mamluks fighting Spaniards on foot, I had also suggested it was an inversion of the traditional iconography of Santiago or St. James at the Battle of Clavijo, where the mounted pale-skinned saint tramples the fallen Moors. And now I see that together, these paintings monumentalize the unrelenting cruelty perpetrated by both sides that characterized the war from which Spain was now emerging. Goy's ability to capture these atrocities would not have been the same had he not so obsessively imagined the individual experience of war reflected in the disasters. Once aware of them, he could not go back. Despite their scale and their official commission, these paintings are hardly heroic. They are disasters writ large. They portray on a life-size scale, usually reserved for heroic deeds, the depravity of men that the war had revealed to all, for all to see. In portraying this, Goya was truly revolutionary. Two comments by way of ad epilogue. Some in the audience may be aware of the controversy over the, the disattribution by the Prado Museum of this image, El Colosso, the Colossus long attributed to Goya. Having looked closely at Goya's imagery of war, I find it impossible to accept this as a work by the artist. The looming figure of the giant could easily have been imitated from uh, uh, Mesotin's et etching of a giant by someone wanting to imitate the artist. But what I find, oops, I'm sorry, what I find most disturbing is the figures in, in the foreground, which are kind of mishmash of, of brush strokes without the kind of clarity of the figures that we've seen evolving in Goya's imagery. And I think those are far more Goyesque than Goya. And to conclude by looking at one painting beyond our time frame. The impact of Goya's new narrative approach extends beyond his imagery of war. It was probably around 1815 that he painted a series of four scenes to which the scene on the right, known today as the Madhouse, belongs. Although the scene might at first seem to repeat the subject of the yard with lunatics painted over two decades earlier, its representation is marked by a new individualization of figures through action and gesture recalling that scene in the making of gunpowder and the making and making of shot. The stock types who grin, fear, or fight in the earlier painting on the left are now replaced by individuals who, whose actions betray their individual delusions of secular, religious, military, and in the foreground, the figure donning the horns of the bull, even animal power down here, the soldier, the papal, figure, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, here, blessing a man, sort of subduing another with something that seems to be a blow dart. So this newly believable invented world attests, I think, to the changes in Goya's style that evolved from 1809 to 14, years that confused the once clear boundaries between caprice and reality. Thank you very much. <laughs>